Okay. So if you look at the microstructure of aluminum foil, it looks like this. It's these layers, right? The reason that it's layered is because the way that they make aluminum foil is they've got these great big hot rollers and they start out with a huge billet of aluminum and they just pass it back and forth between those rollers. Like, it looks kind of like this. You've got these massive rollers, right? And so you start out with a big bar of aluminum and it, as you send it through this roller, it comes out a little bit squished and a little bit longer. And then they bring these together a little bit more and they pass it through again. And they just keep on doing this until, I mean, literally the aluminum, it's crazy. It starts out like a foot thick and when it comes out, it's as thin as the aluminum foil that you now know and love. So it's a huge reduction. And that's because you basically started out with grains that were nice and equiaxed, like here. They were sort of, there wasn't any real texture at first. But when you cold roll it like crazy, they get really smashed out like that. Why would that influence properties? What do you think? So it's just moving them um, in a certain direction. Um, kind of making them longer instead of uh, increasing the area equally, if that... Yeah. Yes. Um, let me ask you this. When we learned about mechanical properties and deformation, we said that what do dislocations do uh, with respect to grain boundaries? Does it make it easier for them to move or harder for them to move? So with um, the dislocations, I remember... And isn't like smaller dislocations make it harder to move? Right. Is that correct? Right. So here we have an example of not only by rolling it, do we introduce more and more grain boundaries, right? You can see that as you cold roll it, you get lots and lots of grain boundaries, but they're, they are, they are anisotropic, right? They're only in certain directions. So a dislocation could still move relatively easily, right? Within the plane of this. I don't know if you can see like my, my mouse moving here but it could move relatively easy here because it's not intersecting any grain boundaries. But a dislocation trying to move vertically in this picture is gonna run into grain boundaries. And so you would expect this material to have one ductility horizontally and a different ductility vertically, right? So even though it's a big bulk material, it still might be anisotropic. It's not like if you order something that isn't a single crystal, you can say, oh great, it won't. it's just gonna be isotropic, we don't have to worry about it it might be textured in a way where you still measure anisotropic properties. And in a lot of metals, that's the case because a lot of metals are cold worked via rolling or something like that. And so you get preferential orientation of the grains like they have done here. Another example of this can be seen with EBSD maps. Um, let's type maps texture. So EBSD, is a tool that shows you the orientation of grains. So we've been talking about our crystal structures. Let's show you one real quick here. Like, let's say that you have this, um, an FCC crystal. And we know that different faces can exist, just like you guys that are at home growing crystals right now, you might uh, see these different faces forming on your crystals, depending on you know the type of crystal you're growing, where you can see those different faces. Well, we can observe those different faces via diffraction as well through something called EBSD, electron backscatter diffraction, right? So when you look at these, you might end up with something like here, they're showing different pole figures where in this material, however it was processed, you can see that most of the grains correlate with the 0001. So this must be a hexagonal system and they're showing that most of them are of a certain sort of orientation. But if they process it a different way over here, they're totally different, right? And so you can end up with uh, texturing actually pretty easily if you process different metals in different ways. And this is just one way to observe that. We didn't learn about it in this class, so you don't need to worry about it being on the test, but I'm just explaining that's how you would see it in the real world. Okay, other questions? Are there gonna be like definition type questions on the midterm? Like for the bullet point for that one, the anisotropic versus isotropic one, and also for like the polymer crystallinity bullet point. I wasn't sure if those would be just like short answer yeah. questions or actually be like problems with it. Uh, good question. This test has, a, I think, a pretty good mixture of short answer and um, quantitative sort of numeric response answer questions. So there are a number okay. of times where I'm going to ask you just a qualitative question where I'm expecting you to explain something in a relatively short way um, to get your points. Okay, cool. Thank you. Other questions I can answer? Can we talk about how Weeble analysis problems would work on the midterm? 
Yeah. Just because yeah. like, the homework problem kind of took a long time and was really in depth, like on Excel and stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I talked to my TAs about this. We think uh, the best way to do a lot of these questions is to not have you be doing extensive fitting of equations or or things like that, like Weibull. Instead, we'll be providing some of those things for you and then we'll ask you to use them, right? So a totally fair question for Weibull would be, I could say like, I could either provide the data, right? I could show you natural log of natural log of one over one minus F, right? I could do that. And then I could plot that against natural log of whatever your failure criteria was, like strength at failure or time until failure or elongation till failure, whatever it may be. So now your data, if it fits the Weibull sort of approach, then it will be roughly linear. We could provide the fit and then I could give you a Y equals, you know, MX plus B sort of thing. And then I could have you use it. That's one approach. And I've done that in years past, right? So that, that would prevent you from having to do the, the effort of generating this plot but you would then have to use the, the content from that plot as if you had generated it. In that case, would we need to use WebPlot Digitizer for no, any reason? No, for, at no point on the exam will you have to use WebPlot Digitizer. In fact, on one of the questions where it's a little bit difficult to read the points, I've actually written them right on the plot. So there's a figure on a test, right? You've got you know some X value plot against some Y and you've got some data points. The data points that I want you to use, I've actually put like a little numbers right by them. I've said like, this is X1, Y1, right? And then this one over here might be like X2, Y2, for example. I've labeled those. That just makes it easier for us to grade them because then there's one right answer and we don't have to rerun your numbers for everybody. It, we'll just see the right answer most of the time. And then we only have to run it on times where there's something is wrong and we're not seeing the right answer. Okay. So you don't need to use Webplot Digitizer on this. You shouldn't be doing any fitting. You will be using like some pretty gnarly math at points, so you can still use solvers, uh, but yeah, you don't need to actually be pulling out data points. Other questions I can answer? So we won't like have to take a screenshot of Excel and attach it to our final Thing. Well, as always, if you are going to use a solver or Excel or whatever for anything you do and you want to have credit for it, then you need to attach a screenshot. So there are times like there are some nasty integrals or some nasty derivatives or things like that. And if you don't want to do that out by hand or at least write it out by hand after doing it online, then you need to take a screenshot of it. Right. Okay. Yep. Can you difference between Flick's first and second law and then what type of word problems would be for which one? Yeah. Yeah, we can do that. So fix first and second law, um, because we called it fix first law instead of Fourier's law, it technically means that we're talking about diffusion uh, of mass, right? So mass diffusion as opposed to heat diffusion, because fix first law with heat actually gets its own name. We call it Fourier's law. But nevertheless, let's just talk big picture for a minute. When do you use fixed first versus second law? If you have steady state, then you're going to use fixed first law. So what are the key words that you're looking for when I say steady state versus non-steady state, which is for fixed second law? Equilibrium. Yeah, equilibrium. What what are so I might say outright equilibrium. What are other words that we might use here? That would be giveaways that you're using one versus the other. A constant rate of change. Yeah, uh, constant rate of change. Constant flux is maybe what you're going after. So if it's constant, then you know that it's fixed first law, right? If it's a constant flux, okay. If the boundary conditions are not changing. So the boundary conditions are, are fixed. I guess that actually works for both. That, that's not quite right. If the concentration or the temperature gradient is not changing, right? So if uh, dc dx not changing, then it's fixed first law. And that could be the same for temperature, right? If temperature gradient is not changing, then it's fixed first law, okay? And therefore the opposite of these, right? So if, if time is given, 
if time is given and asked, if you, if we asked to use time in some way, I guess I could give you a head, red herring. I'd say 15 seconds in, e equilibrium is achieved. And since I use equilibrium, you know that time no longer matters. But if I say find the composition at some time, right? Almost always we're talking about fixed second law because that means that it's changing with time, right? Because remember this equation over here is the one that solves for time, the one with fixed second law, right? So if time is given and asked, it's probably fixed second law. What else? If the flux is changing, right? If flux is not constant, if it's not a constant, then it's probably fixed. It, it is fixed second law. What else? How about this? What if I say like it was all uh, it was constant and then we put something on the surface, right? If something happens at the surface, right? If TS is some different value than it was a moment before, right? TS equals some value up here, but it used to be a different value, then you know that we're dealing with something that's changing with time, okay? Anyways, so that's fixed first law and second law keywords. Now, how do these things look differently? For mass, they look like this. It says that the flux, right? So we use J for flux. And remember, how do we define flux? It's the amount of something per area per time. That's always how flux gets defined. So this is going to be proportional to a constant of proportionality, right? It's going to be negative D, our constant of proportionality, that's our diffusion coefficient, multiplied by the driving force for mass to diffuse in a material. And that's just going to be DC over DX. So this is relatively simple. All you need is the composition difference across some difference in spatially through your sample and the diffusion coefficient. If you have these two things, you can calculate the flux. Meanwhile, for fixed second law under non-steady state conditions, first off, time has to be there, right? So how do we do that? Instead of writing J, what we write, we don't solve for flux because flux is changing. And we didn't give you the equation for flux as a function of time. You'll learn that when you guys take heat transfer classes later on. What we gave you was two equations. If we're talking about mass diffusion, it looked like this. It said that the composition at some position x in your material, we can solve for that because it's going to be equal to, you have to take away from it the initial composition all the way through, divide that by the composition at the surface, something that's causing the diffusion. And that could be a reduction or an increase at the surface, right? You could like suck out all the, the carbon from the surface and now the carbon from the center is going to move towards the surface. It's more often that we do the reverse. We carburize something by adding more carbon at the surface. We increase it relative to the center, but you know, it could go either way. The same equation works for both scenarios. But this is now going to be equal to one minus the error function of the distance that we're talking about over here. This is that same x value, some distance, divided by two times the square root of diffusion coefficient times time, right? So that's fixed first law and fixed second law. If, uh, if we wanted to write dc dx, we could rewrite it. This could be rewritten as the composition at point one minus the composition at point two divided by x, the position at point one minus the x position at point two. That would be another way to rewrite this. Anyways, that's fixed first and second law. Any questions about this? When you're doing the error function of z, are we able to just use the table or do you want us to show the work of um, like, doing y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1? Great question. Uh, my TA asked this, which one we wanted to do. And I think since we have, uh, for the first time ever in this class, just opened it up to using solvers, you can go ahead and just use a solver if you want. If you want to pull up Wolfram Alpha, um, we'll open this up in a second. If you want to go over here to Wolfram Alpha and like your value of error function um, is like 0 0.43, then you can just come right over here and you can just do error function of 0 0.43. And you can just use that value. You'll need to include a screenshot. Otherwise, if you get it wrong, we can't give you any partial credit because we didn't see what went wrong. If you give me a screenshot and I see that you accidentally typed like 0 0.043, then that is a math error. And we take less points off for a math error. That just like you just derped, um, right? But if you don't provide the screenshot and I just see this way wrong number, I'm just like, nope, she's, she's just totally wrong here. So uh, anyways, but you can use Wolfram Alpha. You don't need to do the linear interpolation if you don't want to. If you do use in linear interpolation, we will still give you credit. That's, that's fine. Other questions? And 
in that six second law, that D is once again the diff- diffusion coefficient, correct? Yeah, and this is the key difference between mass and heat transfer. In mass and heat transfer, this is the exact same variable, right? That D is the same D as in D naught multiplied by the exponential of our activation energy for diffusion divided by thermal energy either per atom, like Kb per T, or per RT, and that's per mole. It's more common to do Kb per T for diffusion though. Right, that's the same thing we use there. In mass transfer, this is different, right? In mass transfer, it looks a little bit different, or sorry, in thermal transport, it looks different. We still have fixed first and second law. We call this one now Fourier's law. Fourier's law. It's just fixed first law for heat transfer. And we're still talking about a flux, but sometimes we just call this Q. It's the amount, the amount of heat. And so that's per area, per time. That's often how this gets written. The constant of proportionality is now thermal conductivity. The driving force is no longer gradient in concentration. It's gradient in temperature, right? But over here, it looks the exact same. It's Tx, some temperature at position x, minus T naught, over the surface temperature, minus T naught, equals one minus the error function of uh, x over two times the square root of alpha T, right? So the big difference here is that he with mass transfer, they were the same coefficient, and these are not the same. They're not the same. They're related to one another. We know that thermal conductivity, if you if you want to solve for thermal conductivity and you have thermal diffusivity, you can solve for it if you multiply it times density and times the specific heat. But they're not the same thing. Okay? Okay. Any other questions about this? <laughs> Four years isn't on the study guide that we're not going to be doing it this way. Uh, what did I put on here? I put on here fix first and second law. Uh, you should know how to do that for mass and heat. I think we do one of each. I think we do one of each on the test. So they're basically the same thing. Just make sure that you know which ones to use for which. That up here it's for mass transport, hence the diffusion coefficient. For heat, you're using thermal conductivity and thermal diffusivity, which is pretty straightforward, I think. Okay. Other questions? Um, I was reworking the homework um, for the chapter that we did on grain growth. And it's um, the first problem on uh, chapter seven. And it it's saying that like, um, I was looking at the solutions and on that first part, in order to find like a uh, grain size, you had to find the initial grain size of the steel alloy okay. and then compare it to the initial grain size of the steel sheet. So I was just wondering if like, if that's an initial thing that we have to solve for first is if both the uh, experiment and the sheet have to have the same grain, initial grain size. Uh, great Sorry. question. It totally depends on the way the question gets asked. Let me, let's me let take a look at this. Was this homework eight? Which one was that? Homework uh, seven, seven, problem one. Homework seven, problem one. So yeah. I, if I could like wink through video or through audio, I would be winking at you. Like definitely, definitely review this question, 1B on homework seven. There is an extremely similar one on the exam. So now let's go through how you would do this problem. So. <laughs> It, it could be set up in a bunch of different ways, but the key thing that we use on this type of problem is we combine two things that we've learned. We've learned about hall patch, right? Mm -hmm. Hall yeah. patch, and we learned about grain growth, right? So let's write those two equations real quick. Hall patch says that the yield strength as a function of grain size, right? We could write this parentheses D if we wanted, but they don't usually, but it's as a function of grain size is going to be equal to some constant sigma naught plus k, and again, it's unfortunate that we have the same constant, so I'll put hp down here, times d to the negative one half, where d is our grain size. Therefore, from this equation, you can see that as you get smaller and smaller grains, you get a, a stronger and stronger material. And that's exactly what we were just talking about. Where was it? Oh, it looks like we already got rid of it. But uh, when we reduced our grain size, it made it harder for dislocations to move, so that means this goes up. Right. So that's mm -hmm. this is just a this is not a first principle equation. This is just 
a bunch of people realize that the data fits on it when you plot yield strength over here against grain size to the negative one half, they just realized that it had this really nice straight line and the slope was negative one half, or I guess one half here, the way I've plotted it, okay? Um, so that's all this is saying. It's just an empirical relationship. So the two constants here are this one and this one. These are both constants. So for each given material, you would need to solve those, okay? Now, how's this different from grain growth? Grain growth, the typical way that the equation gets written is that d at some time, we could write like a little time here, d as a function of time, is going to be subtracted from d naught. Uh, how do we write it in class? Was it, did we square it? Let me pull this up real quick. I don't want to get this wrong. Deformation. Uh, it's before this. Okay, right here d to the n minus d naught to the n, okay, equals kt. So these are both raised to exponent n equals k um, times t time, where now what do we have? So this is k for gg. This is a different constant than the one above, right? So k mm -hmm. hp is not the same thing as k gg. They're two different constants. So this guy is a constant, and now it's also this n value. Those are our constants here. Okay? Mm -hmm. D naught is the grain size that you start at. That's your starting size. And this one over here is your final size. And again, I'm gonna get rid of this parentheses t because I don't want you to think that you need to multiply it by that or anything. It's just, I'm just telling you with that that you need to, this is, grain size as a function of how long it's been annealing for, okay? Mm -hmm. Any question on these two equations? Pretty straightforward. So there's a million ways to ask. Solve them for the constants again really quick. How would you solve for them? Yeah. Oh, okay, so how you solve for them depends on what you're given, but you do know this, that for both of these scenarios, there are two constants k and sigma naught, or k and n. And anytime you have two unknowns, you have to be able to write two equations, right? Um, so I would either have to give you one of the constants and give you everything else except for the other one, and then you could just solve it outright. It's much more likely that I'm gonna give you enough information to set up two equations and two unknowns. So these have different forms, these two equations. Um, so let's talk about how you'd solve for hall Petch first. If I gave you um, some yield strength, right, and I gave it as a function of grain size, right, so we'll call this D1. At some D1, I gave you a value. And then I gave you another yield strength at D2. How could you go ahead and solve this? Well, you'd say yield strength in general, so let's just write this for D1 over here, is equal to sigma naught plus K times, this is going to be D1 to the negative one half. Meanwhile, you could write the exact same type of equation, but for d2 equals sigma naught plus k times d2 to the negative one half. If you divided these two by one another, you could take a look at what sort of things start to cancel out. That would be one approach. Um, if I were you, I would just plug this into Wolfram Alpha, like don't waste your time. Um, since we allow you to use solvers, you might as well use it. You could come right over here and you could say in Wolfram Alpha, right? You could say solve. Uh, 2x plus you know y equals 5 and for your second equation 3x minus y equals 10 this may not have a solution so it might yell at me and say there is no solution because I'm just making numbers up but if they do have a point like they do then it will just tell you the values and then I would just screenshot this I'd hit print screen and move right along that's what I would do if I were you I mean your engineers like learn how to use the tools that we're gonna use when we get jobs so this is what I would use so that's what I would do but if you wanted to you could mathematically algebraically solve for them. it's just up to you okay by the way if you divide these two things is does this can I let me ask you this is this allowable to just cancel these like that no yeah, I hope so. definitely no. You would have to. Do, yeah, like you would have to. If you did this, then you could get away with it. If we did this, we could say um, minus sigma naught and minus sigma naught is now equal to this. Then you could make what cancel? You could make k cancel, 
right? You still can't make these cancel. Sigma naughts wouldn't cancel, but at least k's would. So then you could solve for sigma naught. Anyway, I still think that you should just plug it into Wolfram Alpha, but do what you want. Or Python, even better. Okay? So that's how you'd solve for this one. Uh, grain growth is basically the same idea. For grain growth, the two things you need to know is you need to know um, different time periods, right? Not in different grain sizes. Now it's different time periods and what grain size they achieve. So if I say at some temperature, right, at temperature equals, you know, 1000 Kelvin or whatever, I say that when you put it in the furnace, when time equals 60 minutes, right, and you achieve a certain grain size, let's call this time one, and you're gonna achieve some grain size over here. And when you do a different time, when you uh, hold it for 100 minutes, you get a different grain size, a, a larger one. You're gonna do the exact same, same thing as we did before. You're still gonna write, okay, this will be D1 to the N minus D naught, our initial value to the N, equals now K, a constant, times, this is now gonna be time one. And then you're gonna write another one, D2 to the N minus D naught, to the n equals k times time two. So you're gonna do the exact same approach as before. You could divide these two things and voila, your k's cancel, right? And then you could solve for the exponent n or again, plug it into a solver, your choice. Okay? So, so I think it was Sabrina that was asking that maybe. Did that sort of answer your question or do you still have questions? Um, kind of. So I was more so wondering because I was in the solution, you had us solve for um, the initial grain size of the steel alloy experiments first, and then you compared it to the initial grain size given in the problem. And so I was wondering if that was like a, a requirement that we would have to do given oh, okay. like any material and the experiments. Like, do we have to solve for the initial grain size of the experiments? And if it checks out with the one given in the problem, are we good to go to use the grain growth in the whole patch equation? I think it's more important that you think of it like this, that, um, right, as grain size changes, right, as you go <laughs> from like small to large grain size, the tool that you need to use to understand how, how this changes is the grain growth equation. But at any point along this curve, you can calculate yield strength or hardness, it works for both actually, and you do that using hall patch. So <laughs> it, it would depend on the exact scenario of the problem, what information I gave you. Like for example, if I didn't tell you what the initial grain size was, like that's a big unknown, but I do mm -hmm. tell you this size and I'd say that it has this strength, right? You still yeah. don't have enough information to solve for this, right? You can't write two equations with that. That's just one data point. So I would have to give you more information. If I then said that like, okay, that to go from here to here took some time, right? I, now I've given mm -hmm. you a little more information where you could solve for the grain growth to two constants, um, right? But I'd have to give you enough information. So there's just so many ways that you can set these types of questions up that there's not one way that you follow it. Instead, I think it's more important that you understand that you understand how size changes using the grain growth equation. And then at any given point, you can relate that to hardness using or uh, yield strength using hall patch. Gotcha. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep, my pleasure. Anybody else? I don't really have a specific question on it, but can we talk about polymer crystallinity and polymer stress reduction and just the type of stuff we should know about that? You bet. Um, let me give myself some more room on this. Where did I start typing up here? Oh, I don't think I did. All right, whatever. So with crystallinity, um, polymers are kind of, in some ways, they're kind of like that graphene that, that we started drawing earlier, right? Graphene was big sheets of graphite or graphite is a bunch of sheets of graphene, and the bonding between these layers is weak. It's van der Waals, right? And van, van der Waals are really weak compared to covalent or ionic bonds. Um, 
And that's essentially the best we get out of most polymers. Most polymers don't have strong bonds. Instead, instead of being these relatively flat layers like graphene, and instead of being planes, they're lines, right? Where we can approximate them as lines, right? Linear chains. But these chains can still line up one relative to another, right? As they line up to each other, and it's still going to be van der Waals forces that hold these things together. These things are going to interact with van der Waals forces one with another, okay? Van der Waals forces are strengthened. The better these things can line up with each other, the stronger those van der Waals forces are. So if you can get them closer together, that tends to have stronger forces. So with that in mind, what if I've got this scenario? What if my polymer looks like this? I've got this backbone, like a carbon-carbon normal backbone, but then I've got this humongous side group, right? One of these, or I've got like a really big, like chunky side group off the side, and then it goes off to something, right? those things are going to prevent another chain from lining up nicely next to it, right? That can't happen, and therefore the bonding is going to be weaker, and therefore it's less likely to be as crystalline. So if we zoomed out and we saw like those nice crystalline regions separated by amorphous regions and then another nice crystalline region, you're just going to see less of these nice crystalline regions if they can't stack up nicely with one another. So what things will help us stack up nicely? Well, we've already said if you don't have side groups at all, it's going to be better, right? That's why polyethylene, which only has just hydrogens coming off the side, tends to be a highly crystalline polymer. And so does Teflon, because it has no side groups except for just fluorine on all the sides. But as soon as you start to introduce side groups, that makes it harder for it to be crystalline. And then, okay, let's say that like we can't get around the fact that we're going to have some side group, right? So let's just write a generic R for our side group. R just stands for some uh, radical side group, okay? What if we have these on every side, but they're at least always on the one side, right? What do we call that? U uniform. It is uniform, but there's a word for it with polymers. So if you go back to chapter four, where we talked about polymers, it's called isotactic. So you'll want to go and review these. I think it's worthwhile to review them. It's near the bottom here, right here with our isomers. So we have isotactic, syndiotactic, and atactic. Atactic means there's no order. A means lacking. Tactic is meaning like order in here. I don't know what the exact Greek origin means, but here it's meaning sort of order, right? Isotactic, same. Iso means same. Isotactic, so same side or same order. They're all on the same side, so this is isotactic. Syndio means alternating, so this is an alternating one. And then this is random. Which of these are going to be more crystalline, right? Which one's more likely to crystallize? Well, just think about which ones are going to stack closer together. It's going to be the isotactics, right? If you've got these, um, this scenario, which you just drew, where the side group is on the same side, right? At least these things can more or less stack up because they're all on the same side. In fact, this can be even favorable. If that side group is a polar one, like if it's got like a big negative charge, it can induce a positive. This can actually lead to really strong bonds between these chains, right? That can lead to a strong van der Waals bond. But think how much harder this is going to get if this starts alternating. What if we get like a big side group over here? Now you've got a negative next to a negative. That's not going to help us bond. That's not going to lead to a crystalline polymer. So if they can all be on the same side, isotactic, that's going to improve crystallinity. If it's syndiotactic, that's a little bit better. And if it's atactic, that's sort of the worst. What if um, you had a repeating syndiotactic and then the alternating kind of fit in like puzzle pieces? Yeah, that's what you can still achieve. Yeah, you can still achieve um, crystallinity with syndiotactic. Like what you're describing is this. Like let's say that you've got some big side group over here and then it alternates. Um, so let's say that, I mean, what do we, how do we want to draw this? Let's say, I guess it's like this. So this is now our repeat unit like that. So then this one goes down again and this one goes up and this one goes down. But another polymer could do, let's try and draw it, more or less the same. So this one, now this one could go up and then this one could go down and then this one could go up. So it sort of filled, like there was this empty gap there anyways. And so that's why you can still get crystallinity with syndiotactic, but it's not as good as isotactic. This is better. Yep. So are all these polymers not the same? Like each each row would be a different polymer? They wouldn't just be a repeating one of the same one? Well, when you say, it, that's a bit of a trick question. Like when you say the same polymer, are you saying like the same same chemistry? 
I guess I was just imagining that each um, row would have the same chemistry so that it would fit like puzzle pieces versus two ones with different um, like patterns wouldn't fit together as well. Uh, yeah, so these are the same chemistry. I'm trying to draw like that these are the same. I've just shifted it over by one. And in fact, it's more common that these are actually the exact same chain, right? This chain just looped around, did whatever it had to do, and then it looped around. And then as we went down, it did whatever, and then it, it connected again, right? This is actually the same chain folding back on itself. So most of the times when you learn about polymer crystallinity, that's the sort of idea. Uh, let's see, polymer crystallinity... Um, fold on itself. There's actually really cool things where they're doing simulating how proteins fold in on themselves. Uh, protein folding is a really hot area of research and not in material science, but in like biology and chemistry. But this is the kind of scenario, right? It's all the same long chain because these things are super duper long if it's a high molecular weight polymer. And so the region that's crystalline might actually be a relatively short region. It just zigzags on itself over and over and over. And eventually it gets to a point like they've shown here where you might get some amorphous regions in between them, but you still have big regions that are crystalline. And again, you can only achieve that if your material lends itself to crystallinity. And one thing is not having side groups. And if you do have side groups, isotactic is the best. And then this, this is okay. But if it's atactic, that's really gonna mess it up because now you've got like one randomly here and that's gonna cause this big uh, steric or electronegative interaction, depending on if these are charged. Steric is when it's just that they're taking up the same space and that's not good. But if these have a charge on them, like if this is positively charged, now you've got a positive right next to a positive. So that's really not favorable. Okay. So I would go back to chapter four. Again, it was near the end of chapter four. And I would just review these things, polymer cr crystallinity. I think that that would be worth your time. Polymer stress relaxation too. Oh, okay, yeah, good question. So let's talk about stress relaxation. Polymers, uh, much more so than other materials, are way more likely to undergo stress relaxation where the stress that you think it's loaded to now actually is a function of time. So, right, you applied some initial stress, sigma naught, but you have to multiply that now by the exponential of, it's gonna be the negative uh, Young's modulus multiplied by time divided by the uh, viscosity. So if you initially applied, let's say, I don't know, 10 megapascals to your polymer, what's happening is the, your polymer, again, it's made up, if you zoomed in on it, it's a bunch of these crystalline regions and then amorphous regions and then crystalline regions maybe, uh, that might be a crystalline polymer, right? What could happen is as you pull on this thing, what's going to happen is these, there's lots of things that could happen. First off, you could imagine that it gets longer leaving the crystalline regions alone. That's one possibility. But what happens is these amorphous regions start to stretch out. That would be one scenario that would allow deformation. So if your material is deforming like this, it got longer, right? This has now some larger, this is now L initial plus some delta L, it got longer. And since it got longer, that reduced the, the stress on your material, right? It, it accommodated the initial stress by getting longer. Therefore, it now has some reduced stress and this is stress relaxation, okay? So this is the equation that you can use to calculate stress relaxation. Obviously, if it's gonna, if it's gonna relax a lot, if you're gonna get a big reduction to some much smaller stress, then you either have to wait a really long time. T, I'm looking at my bookshelf right next to me and it's got this really nasty bow in it where it's over a long time, it's creeped, right? The polymer has creeped down over time. So that can happen. Or you can have a really, <clears throat> um, if it's an elevated temperature, your modulus, your viscosity goes way up, meaning that these chains, uh, sorry, your, your viscosity goes down, excuse me. Meaning these chains can go from whatever they were previously to this new scenario much more easily right? Viscosity is a, is a measure of how things flow. These chains have to flow past one another to stretch out like that. So if you don't have a, if you have a low viscosity, then it's going to do that more easily than a high viscosity. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, sorry, that makes sense. Okay. Other questions? Can we go over glassy transition? 
Yeah. Yep. Glassy transition is, again, a characteristic of polymers more than anything. And the idea is this, that if you plotted um, viscosity, but they usually talk about Young's modulus, right? So the stiffness of your polymer as a function of temperature. Many polymers have this sort of characteristic sort of shape. It starts out really high at low temperatures, right? So this is low temp. And what do we know about polymers? At low temperatures, they kind of look like a glass. They look like a ceramic. So this is our glassy region, okay? And then there exists a point where it will usually transition to a rubbery plateau. So this is our rubbery plateau. And then for some materials, it will actually drop and it will flow. And basically you get your modulus dropping to nothing and it's just flowing like a liquid. Like you technically water does have a stiffness, but it is a very, very low stiffness because you've no longer in this rubbery region. Okay. So does water look like this? If you plotted the glassy curve, you know, for water, what would it look like? So it doesn't look like that. Water, it undergoes a really sharp transition, right? At its freezing point, right? At its solidification point. It's when it undergoes solidification where at temperatures higher than that, you have a water with some really low viscosity. And then it has basically a step function where it becomes now a very rigid ice. Ice is an extremely stiff material. It's not compliant at all. It just goes from looking like a ceramic to a liquid, right? So it doesn't look like polymers, but polymers often do look like this, right? Because they have these long chains and that's the difference. Water is made up of a bunch of molecules. When it forms ice, these things line up perfectly in an arrangement. Actually, there's lots of different types of ways that it can arrange, like 11 different structures for ice, but it's some sort of specific arrangement. But that's not what's happening in a polymer. In a polymer, you get these chains, right, that can be all over the place. And so as you warm it up, they can sort of, it's called reptation. They can slide past one another by sort of rotating around one another. Um, and this would only happen in something where you have these really long chains which can tangle together in different ways. So you don't see it in really short molecules like this. You don't see it when methane freezes. You don't see it when CO2 freezes or, or liquid nitrogen. But you do start to see it with many polymers because these long chains can start to slide past each other. And that leads to this rubbery behavior. Like, what if I took this polymer right here and I pull on it, right? In order to pull on it, these chains could maybe start to slide past one another. Like this guy starts to slide a little bit and this one starts to slide that way but it's tangled right there and it's tangled right here. And that tangle is gonna cause it when I release it to probably wanna go back, right? This thing's gonna to wanna to go back after I release, release the load. And so you get this rubbery elastic response. And again, that's a, a function of having these sort of tangles like this. So anyways, this is glassy transition curves. It's very common for polymers. We can modify these curves. For example, if you cross link a polymer, you maybe have seen this. If you ever try and like melt a tire, Tires don't usually melt because they've been cross-linked. So even though you heat them up, most times you heat polymers up like polyethylene. If you took a magnifying glass and you put it on a GI Joe, he would melt, right? And it would flow. You would get flow like this. But if you have a cross-linked polymer, it doesn't flow. It just keeps on going. That's a bad color to use, right? But this would just keep on going until it burns. And once it burns, you have no modulus anymore. It's a gas, okay? Or if you made it crystalline, if you made it crystalline, you strengthen the bonds between these layers, right? The, the bonds in these regions have been strengthened by making it more crystalline. So what you might achieve with that is you might push this glassy transition to a higher temperature, right? This point at which it starts to switch from a glass to a rubber, which we call TG, right? That would be offset in these different scenarios. You've got one value and a different value depending on maybe crystallinity. And crystallinity we know is affected by things like molecular weight and side groups and all the stuff we just talked about. Other questions? So if I understand what you're saying is like uh, kind of low temperatures, it's tangled enough, tangled enough that it won't go back or like they will kind of like move back, but heating it up kind of lets it, gives enough energy to rotate and kind of un untangle almost. Yeah. You, you guys remember this game in elementary school where you get like 20 people and they all reach their hands in and you just grab somebody else's hand and then they ask you to turn it into a giant ring? You guys have played that, right? So 
the only reason that you can untangle yourselves is because you allow people to sort of like lift it over their heads and you climb over your feet, right? And eventually you can untangle it. So imagine a scenario where people are too cold and they can't move. You can't untangle that, right? You have to have some amount of thermal energy to sort of lift and stretch those bonds and rotate. And we call that reptation with polymers when you can sort of twist the polymer chain around and got it to move. And basically there's a, there's a temperature when you go below that, it just can't do it. But above that temperature, it can. And so you get flow. Or you know you may get flow if you really heat up, but otherwise you're gonna get rubbery behavior, okay? Other questions? Can we go over how um, recovery, recrystallization, and grain growth relate to toughness or like hardness? I guess I don't know yeah. what word it is. Yeah, they relate to all those things actually. So good okay. question. Um, so let's start with what's happening under it, right? To get recovery, like the name suggests, you have to be recovering a property that you lost. So let's go ahead and plot something like hardness as a function of cold working. What happens as you cold work a material more and more? What happens to its hardness? All right, so if this was percent cold working, assuming no heat treatments, the hardness should go up and up and up, right? Because as you cold work it more and more, if you looked at the microstructure over here, there might be a couple dislocations. But by the time you get to this point, if you haven't heated it or anything, you've got dislocations like all over the place, right? So remember what happens. These dislocations, the more that there are in a material, the harder it is for any given one. Like this guy right here has a hard time moving because he's going to run into all these ones that are around him. Whereas this one down here can move pretty easily because it's not experiencing much interaction. So as you cold work things, it gets harder and harder. And if you've ever done any blacksmithing, you've seen this to be the case, right? You take the thing out of, a, out of the furnace, you set it on the anvil, right? And it's at some hot temperature. When you initially start smacking it, you see it deform quite a bit. Like the first two, three hammer strikes, it deforms a lot. But each subsequent hammer strike, it doesn't deform nearly as much because it's cooling down for one, but also because you're cold working it and you're introducing these dislocations. So it gets harder and harder. And in fact, if you keep on cold working this, a good blacksmith will tell you to stop, take this piece out like you've deformed it to that point now, put that in the furnace, and then you get rid of all these dislocations and you restore it, you, you reset the cold working back to a low number by recovery. Recovery is the process by which you started with, you had all these dislocations. We're gonna get rid of them by going back to something that looks like this. And now you can pound on it again and you could pound it into you know, aluminum foil if you want or whatever you're trying to do, you can smash it way, way out, okay? So recovery is the process of removing dislocations and other impurities, or not impurities, but imperfections in your material via heat treatment, right? Because remember, in your material, a dislocation looks like this. You've got these rows of atoms, right? But you had this extra half row. So that right there is a dislocation. But somewhere else in your material, right, if you kept on going, maybe you've got another extra half row of atoms over there. This is now one of the opposite sign. If you're allowing this to slowly move this way and this one to move that way, they will eventually, this extra half row will meet with that extra half row and you've just got a regular material and all of a sudden, voila, you now have a defect free material. It just looks like a normal material there. That's how you go from this scenario on the right to this one on the left. That is recovery. It takes temperature. You have to heat it up. I think we gave you a rule of thumb in class. Let's pull it up just to be sure we get it right. I think it was like one half the melting point. Let's pull it up. Okay, right here, oh, that's recrystallization. Recovery typically occurs at one third to one half of the, oh, that's recrystallization, sorry. Recovery, it must be less than that. So probably less than a third of its melting point. So you can do this at relatively, you know, not crazy temperatures. You don't have to go to insanely high temperatures to get this to happen. But that's why a blacksmith will put it back in the furnace because you're basically resetting it. You're bringing the cold working back down, not to zero, but you're bringing it way down. Now, there exists a scenario where you can jack up your crystal so much, right? You introduce so many dislocations, so much messed up lattice, right? You're, you're, there's so many atoms out of position, broken bonds, that the amount of work that would have to be done in terms of rearranging atoms to go from this back to this is more work 
than to just do a different option. And now you're going to recrystallize. So you had this really messed up grains, which were tiny. You're going to start to just grow new grains, right? Little. This is just like we talked about in chapter 11, where these are now nuclei. You have little nuclei growing, but it's not of a second phase. Well, not technically a second. I guess it's technically a second phase because this phase could be thought of up here, this parent phase. The parent phase, let me get rid of these orange lines. So the parent phase could be thought of as material, you know, alpha with dislocations, right? Whereas the the new phase, right, the nuclei is material alpha, but it's without any dislocations, right? So it's going to nucleate from this previous phase, and then these things grow over time, right? They get bigger and bigger and bigger until what you end up with is this scenario where you've got grains in your material, but these are now totally free of dislocations. I think the example we gave in class is like, you could buy a fixer upper house, but at some point you can just buy like worse and worse and worse houses. And you could still try and like flip it yourself by like actually remodeling it. That's re That would be recovery. But if it's so messed up, if it's like a meth house, something horrible that you just don't want to try and fix it, it'd be too much work. You could just bulldoze the house and then slowly grow a new house out of its crumbled remnants. That would be recrystallization. Okay. Any questions about this? So what starts recrystallization? Like, um, um, so what are the, the driving default? forces? Let me ask that. What should be the driving forces for this to happen? There's way too many dislocations. Yep. What do dislocations do in terms of energy? Right, dislocations look like this. You've got these lattice, right? And then if I stuff in an extra half row of, you know, lattice there, what is it doing to it? These atoms right here are crowded and they don't want to be. And these atoms right down here are being pulled apart and so they don't want to be. So this is tension, <clears throat> sorry, this is compression up here on top. This is tension on the bottom. So we call this elastic strain of the lattice. The lattice is being stretched in ways that it doesn't like. So this is elastic strain. That's one driving force is the reduction of elastic strain. And the other driving force is as you deform this more and more, like maybe you started out with like some pretty big grains to start with, but now you've got like grains going all the way through this because you deform it. Every time you smack it with a hammer, there's a chance that you're gonna split a grain into two. And so you end up with lots and lots of grains and grains have surfaces with them. So surface energy reduction is the other driving force. You've got surface energy and you've got elastic strain energy. These two things are the driving force for you to get, um, well, both recovery and recrystallization. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Hear my wife wrapping gifts in the background with the loudest wrapping paper that we own, apparently. Can you go over the relationship between thermal expansion and the equation that sets equal to K over density times heat capacity? Oh, sure. To do that, let's first do a unit analysis. We like to do those to make sure we understand it. So if we go back up here to, where was it? Here, right? So what would be the units of this? Um, let's do it off on the side. So the units of thermal conductivity are watts per, or I don't like the pencil, let's switch to pen, are watts per meter Kelvin. And a watt is just equal to a joule per second. So that's a joule per second per meter per Kelvin. So on the right-hand side of the equation, we know the units of density. So we've got these three things. <clears throat> the units of density are the easiest. That is kilograms per meter cubed or grams per centimeter cubed, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, heat capacity, what are the units of heat capacity? Well, like the name suggests, heat capacity, right? It's gonna be how much heat, Q, 
uh, can go into your material. So that can be joule. That's a, that's measured in joules, excuse me, not Q. The unit is joules. And then it's per amount of material. Let's keep it simple and do mass per degree Kelvin change, right? So that's joules per kilogram of material per Kelvin. So what must be the units of thermal diffusivity? Um, if you look at this, if we started canceling things out, we would see that the joules cancel out both sides of the equation. These kilograms cancel out with each other. The Kelvin cancels out with that, but the seconds doesn't cancel out. And over here we have meters cubed, but we need it to just be meters. So that means that this must have the units of millimeter, uh, well, let's just do meters, meters squared per second. And that will get us the right units. So that's, that's what this equation has in terms of unit analysis. So if you wanna use it, you can literally just plug these three things in. Again, this is thermal diffusivity, this is density, and that's specific heat. If you just plug those in with those units, you will get your thermal conductivity kappa with the units that you're interested in, okay? Wait, how are the Kelvins canceling out? Uh, the Kelvins, because they're, they're in denominator on both sides of the equal sign. All right, here's our equal sign. So you've got a Kelvin right here. Mm -hmm. Right, this is one Kelvin right here, and you've got another Kelvin over here. So those cancel out with each other. You could multiply Kelvin by both sides and they would cancel. Okay. The same reason why the joules cancel out, right? This J cancels with that J, this K cancels with that K. Okay. Dr. Sparks, could we possibly go over uh, heat capacity or thermal diffusivity? Div I can't say it on the last page. On the or last section. Page? What do you mean? In the last section of the uh, review, the guide. Oh, let's pull it up and see. What do I say about this? Uh, thermal diffusivity capacity. So let's go back to the chapter and just remind ourselves what we learned about it. Okay. Um, here's what we were just learning about in terms of thermal conductivity, right? So maybe one thing we could ask is how these things change with temperature, right? What does density do as you heat a material up? Does the density change? What do you think? When it gets smaller. Yeah, density actually gets slightly smaller. It's not a huge change, but why should it get smaller? <clears throat> Density is it when smaller. you be uh, oh, sorry. sorry oh go ahead oh sorry i say once you be increasing the volume yeah because thermal expansion is typical that means that you are going to reduce it with temperature because uh thermal expansion right thermal expansion uh let's just write it you're not like the same amount of mass is there. Let's assume that you're not like boiling off atoms or you're not subliming atoms, right? So therefore your lattice is expanding, but the same num same amount of mass is present. So you actually see a slight reduction with temperature. It's not a big reduction. We're talking really small, okay? I think we usually assume that it reduces by like one PPM per K. So it's not a big difference. What about heat capacity? How does it change with temperature? What does it do with temperature? Well, let's go back to our notes on it and learn about it. <clears throat> heat capacity is the first thing we learned about in this chapter. And we said that there's something called the Dulong Petit Law, this right here, that said heat long, that heat capacity starts out low and it gets larger and it reaches this point at three times the gas constant where many materials reach it and sort of saturate and reach an asymptote at that value because atoms can vibrate in three different dimensions, right? They can vibrate in the X, Y, and Z, but then they can't vibrate in different dimensions. So it becomes a constant. Sorry, I'm gonna close the door because my kids are noisy. <clears throat> so it rises with temperature but then it usually stops. And there's all sorts of fluky, crazy things that when it doesn't do that, but that's the general rule of thumb, right? So it increases, uh, increases with temperature because of Dulong Petit, right? 
but it reaches uh, an asymptote and it stops. And thermal diffusivity, what should it do with temperature? Well, let's go back and take a look at that. We learned about that in chapter 17 as well. If we scroll down a bit um, above this, right here. Thermal conductivity typically rises and then it falls. Thermal diffusivity can be thought of as, think of it sort of like the diffusion coefficient, but for heat. If it's higher, then you get more diffusion. If it's lower, then you get less diffusion of heat. So phonon scattering starts to become dominant at high temperatures. So it rises and then it falls is a very common thing. This is thermal conductivity, but thermal diffusivity often looks very much like this. So thermal diffusivity tends to fall off with temperature above, you know, these are mostly cryogenic temperatures down here where it's rising. For above room temperature, it's usually falling with respect to temperature. Let's take and take a look at some of these actually. Let's plot thermal diffusivity. <clears throat> for many materials, this is a very common plot for thermal diffusivity. It usually falls off and there are exceptions like air, and air doesn't count, that's not a solid, it's, it's behaving very differently. But most of the time, thermal diffusivity falls off with temperature, right? So I think it's important to know these temperature relationships to understand how this all comes together. So again, it falls off, it decreases with temperature, and why does it start to decrease? Do you guys remember? What causes it? We said phonon scattering, but what do we mean by that? Again, what are phonons? Phonons are waves of displaced atoms. <clears throat> so if we go way back up to our, like this, these atoms, you could imagine like pushing it from this side. Like I, I gave this a little push to get started and that caused this wave to go like that. Well, think about the football game, which starts in 20 minutes. If there were people there at the game, we'd be seeing the wave happening occasionally, right? What happens to the wave if one side of the stadium starts it going one way, but somebody on the other side of the stadium starts it going another way, and then they meet? What happens? People get confused, right? That, that wave is less likely to propagate the more waves that we have going. Like if you started 10 different waves in a stadium, all going sort of random directions, clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise, just whatever, it's not very likely that those are going to continue propagating because they're going to scatter off of one another. And it's the exact same thing with atoms. The more phonons there are, the more likely they are to scatter one another. And so we call this umklop scattering. I can't remember what umklop stands for. Oh, I remember. It means like reverse in German or something or upside down. Um, I'm not going to explain why you have to get into quantum for that. But they scatter off of one another. And so we're not going uh, so that is why you typically see a reduction as you heat it up because phonons are thermally activated so you get umklop scattering umklop scattering where the more the higher temperature you are the more phonons there are and therefore the more likely they are to scatter off one another and i think the example i gave when i talked about it on the video was think of like a subway station in a crowded city if you wanted to walk across the subway station when no one's there it's very easy to do but if you try and walk across the subway platform during rush hour when there's loads of people, you can't do it because you're scattering against other people. That's exactly what happens. Adding temperature basically adds more people to the subway platform. It makes more and more phonons and so they start to scatter off of one another. Okay? When in doubt, I would go back and review the notes from chapter 17 or reread that chapter because um, that is going to be something that's on the test. Anything else on here look concerning? Is there going to be anything about vacancies and the number of vacancies? Um, you should understand that. I sort of tied it into a different question. So yeah, I think that you should know that. Um, so again, if you have forgotten the general equation, it's back in chapter five when we got to imperfections and it was the very, it's right here. It's the very first thing we talked about. So the number of vacancies 
Um, we don't always talk about the number of vacancies. It's more common to talk about the concentration of vacancies where you take NV and divide it by N. If you want to know the concentration of vacancies, then you're talking about the number of vacancies but divided by the number of sites where you have vacancies eligible for being, right? So this is like total number of lattice sites, and then this is the number of lattice sites that are missing an atom, okay? To, to solve for this fraction, this, this concentration, you need to know the formation energy, QV, right? The formation energy for vacancies. Um, so then it's exponential of negative QV over KVT. I think you should know that. Can you talk about how that would be related to one of the concepts on the study guide? Um, no, I don't think I'll say that. Um, I'll just instead review to make sure you understand this. And then in the problem, it makes it explicit, the relationship. Other questions? Um, I guess going along with this, um, for finding N, do are we just using like the density and Avogadro's number? Like, will that be given or something that we can easily look up, or will it be something a little different? Kind of like the homework problem we had on this was a little um, different to find um, N. I'm not going to have you solve for N on the exam. You won't okay. Need to. Yep, you won't need to. You can get around it. <clears throat> Other questions? I was wondering, you wrote thermal conductivity twice in the term review study guide. Did we happen to learn about it in more than one context? Because I don't remember. Oh, I did. Um, I wrote two questions on it. And so the way when uh -huh. I write this study guide, I literally write the exam first and then I go problem by problem. And I just say what the key sector, like this would be like 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 2A, 2B, and so, so forth. So I must have just done two questions and didn't realize that. So, nope. We just learned about one thermal conductivity. I just used it twice on the test. Oh, okay. What's chapter 17? That's chapter 17. A lot of chapters. <laughs> now I'm starting to now get a little too close to you. They're a little right. too similar. Yep. And I think that I have posted all of the notes, all the videos and all the notes um, should be up online. So if my scribbles are helpful. Those should be on Canvas. And let me know if they're not, but I think that they are. I think the TAs or you like mentioned that usually the average on the midterms like goes up per midterm. So would you say that this midterm is like easier than <laughs> concept wise or? I mean, we cover a whole lot more stuff, so it's not that it's less to study for, but I think people learn test-taking strategies is honestly one of the biggest things. You know that, like I've, I, I tell people from day one that the homeworks look like the midterms because they are old midterm questions, but I don't think people really believe it, and so they're not, they're taken uh, you know, back from that when they first see it on the first midterm. For whatever reason, the scores always year after year improve. Uh, so I don't know exactly the reason why. Maybe it's easier material. I don't know. Sweet. I mean, free energy is pretty gnarly. So maybe, yeah, phase diagrams are pretty gnarly. That first stuff, electrochemistry, that's all pretty nasty stuff. So that's just hard. Can you go over uh, single crystals? Yes. So this was in chapter eight, if you want to review it, <clears throat> but I'll just do it here. Single crystals can slip. Um, and so first off, the first thing I think that you should know is it looks sort of like this, like you've got some crystal, right? And so you're pulling on it perfectly normal. So you think that you're applying pure tension. You don't think that you're applying a shear force, right? What would shear look like? Shear would look like this, that you apply a force like 
parallel to the face right there and parallel to that bottom face down there, that would be a shear force. You don't think you're applying a shear force because the angle right between your force and that plane right here is 90 degrees. So you think it's pure tension. Nevertheless, at some imaginary plane in your material, like some plane, right, that can exist at, there's lots of different planes, but let's just pick one. This plane in your material, which has a normal direction to it, right, on that plane, you could break up this force, this vertical force, by now doing this transformation, it gets split into a component that's normal to it and a component that is perpendicular to it. So a a portion of that is shear. Like this is your shear component. Does this make sense? You mechanical engineers have seen this before, right? You have a shear component on some plane in your material. So since there's a shear component, all of a sudden along that direction, right? You can have slip occurring. So again, slip, think of these atoms in your material you could by tension like pull these things apart and this bond between these things you'd have to like overcome that bond and just break it and that takes um, a larger force than just sliding these atoms past one another that would be shear so shear is always more likely to occur than fracture but <clears throat> when you loaded this thing initially you didn't think shear could occur but you forgot to account for the fact that you can break up this by changing your orientation, right? You're doing a transformation of your axes here. And now you do have a shear component that might correspond with the slip direction where it's favorable. So the way that we calculate this in material science is you have to know the angle between the normal and your load direction. So this is our load direction. And then this is our, over here, our normal to the slip plane. And then this guy over here is our slip direction. To solve for slip in a single crystal, we need to know these angles, right? So this one, this one goes up there. You need to know these two angles. Uh, what do we call them? Let me make sure I get it right. The one between the normal and the load is called, is called, between the normal and the load is called phi. And the other one's called lambda. So this angle right here is phi, and then this angle right there is called lambda. Everybody follow me so far setting this up? Anybody lost so far? Will you repeat what the second angle that's lambda is between? Okay, lambda, so let me just write these out. So lambda is the angle between the load direction and the slip direction. So it's literally the direction that uh, we showed here. Like these things are going some direction, even though you loaded it in some other direction. So it would be the angle between those, okay? That would be lambda. Whereas phi, phi is the angle between your load direction and your normal to the slip plane. And then we had this really awesome trick that if in, in cubic systems only, and this is really important, it's only for cubic systems. If your plane is like the one zero zero, then the normal to that plane is the one zero zero direction. If your plane is the one one two direction, then the normal to it is the one one two direction. That only works for cubic systems. In non-cubic systems, you have to do some really nasty math, but we're not gonna do those in this class, okay? So, that's these two angles. If you can solve these two angles, all of a sudden you can calculate the shear that's present in your crystal. It's gonna be equal to whatever your initial load was, right? Whatever tensile load you applied to this thing, multiplied by the cosine of phi times the cosine of lambda. Uh, I, I reversed those, but you know what I'm saying. Okay, so then this shear that exists on some plane in your material if that shear is greater than tau CRSS, the critical resolved shear stress, then you get slip. So when I say the tau critical resolved shear stress, kind of think of that like a, a yield strength for your material. It's not technically yield strength because this is now shear, not like a regular tensile load, but you get the same effect. 
If you apply a stress greater than the yield stress, you start to get your material yielding. If you apply a load such that the resolved shear stress is greater than the critical resolved shear stress, then you get planes of your single crystal slipping past one another, which looks pretty cool. You can actually see these in macroscopic images of single crystals. I think I showed one here. Like here's an actual image of a single crystal. They were pulling it and you can see like, here's the plane on which it's happening. You can see the direction on that plane. Even though they were loading this thing vertically up and down, they got slipping and it looks like a bunch of pennies stacked on each other now because they were slipping along those planes. Okay. So that is how you do slip in a single crystal. Well, let me ask you this. If let's say I make this really easy and I tell you some of the loading directions, I say that the um, loading direction, right, is equal to, I don't know, one, zero, three, right? So that's horrible, right? You load it on the 103 direction and we're talking about slip and let's say it's a body centered cubic crystal. So the slip planes I think are along the body diagonals. So those are our slip plane are going to be 110. I'm pretty sure that's what they are in that, that crystal. So they are uh, the planes, we use round brackets. Those are 110 planes. So let's say it's happening on that plane, therefore the normal to that specific plane, but we could just as easily done a member of that family. So let's say it's that member. So the direction is going to be that direction. And then the slip direction are along the body diagonals. So those are the one, one, ones. So <clears throat> I was getting nice. Let's draw it. So I make sure I pick one that's actually in that plane, All right? So where is the one, one, oh, crystal? We could draw that. Let's pick an origin and we're going to draw the one bar one zero. Okay. So if we draw this one, it's going to go out of our plane. So I'm going to move my origin right here for a minute, just so it doesn't leave our crystal unit cell. So it's going to go one in the X direction. It's going to intersect right here. It's going to go negative one in the Y. So it's going to go there and it's never going to intersect the Z because it's equal to zero here. So that was infinity, right? So therefore it's this plane that we're talking about. That's the plane that we're talking about. Slip is happening on that plane. So we need a direction along the body diagonal in this plane. So it could either be this way. It could be, it could be that direction, that direction, the other way, or the other way. It's one of those four directions. Okay. So those are our slip directions. So we'll call that slip direction. Let's just assume it's this one for a minute. Let's calculate what it would be if that was the crystal direction, slip direction. So what is the, what is that direction? That's going one in the X, it's going one in the Y, it's going one in the Z. So that is the one, one, one direction. Okay. So to do this problem now that the, and the hard part's over, we've already figured out what these three values were for our three directions. Now we just need the, the, um, the angles between them, right? So we would come up here and we'd say, okay, phi is between the load and the slip. So that's between 103 and 111. We need to figure out the angle there. So again, the trick we learned about in class is we said, if you have two vectors, A and B, and you wanna figure out the cosine of some angle between them, you do A dot B, and you divide that by the length of vector A times the length of vector B. So again, when you do the dot product, we're gonna just multiply these terms together and add them. So let's go ahead and do that. So it's gonna be, this will be equal to one times one plus zero times one plus three times one. And then the length of those vectors is you just square each of the terms in each of these and then you take the square root. So it's gonna be one squared plus zero squared plus three squared, square root of that. Multiply that, <clears throat> right? So we're gonna multiply that by this other one, which is going to be one squared plus one squared plus one squared, and we're gonna take the square root of that. So when I figure this out, it's going to be one plus three in the numerator, so four up top. And then in the denominator, we're gonna have square root of 10 multiplied by the square root of three, okay? So that is equal to the cosine of your angle between them. And guess what? You don't have to solve for the angle because in our equation, they don't actually solve for the angle. They just want the cosine of the angle. So that's as far as you have to go. You would take this value right here and you would drop it directly in, where are we? All the way up for right there. You plug it in right there. And then you do the same thing for phi. And then you'd apply the load and you'd say, you've now got a shear stress. 
is that greater than the critical resolve shear stress, which would have to be given you because that's a materials constant. Different materials have different critical resolved shear stresses depending on how they're bonded together. But you could say, yeah, slip occurs or slip doesn't occur, or you'd have to apply such and such a stress to make this large enough to get slip to occur, right? There's lots of questions we could ask about this. Does that make sense? Yeah, just uh, how did you get the 111 again? Um, <clears throat> it had to do with what we talked about in the beginning of chapter, I think we talked about it here. Let's go back. We talked about slip systems. Yeah, here we did. So here we did a slip system for FCC. We said the following. We said that a favorable slip system minimizes distortion. And the way that we minimize distortion is by doing it on the most densely packed plane in the most uh, densely packed direction. So the most densely packed plane in the FCC lattice is the 111 plane. And then in that plane, the most densely packed directions are these ones along the edges of the triangle. And those are these ones cutting across the faces here. So those are, you know, some specific direction. For BCC, I think we mentioned, uh, oh, we didn't actually work it out in class. So they happen, if you look at the, you could calculate the, the planar density for BCC and you'd see that they happen in this plane because you've got one atom in the center for BCC. So that becomes the most densely packed plane, this plane right here, again, which is the, uh, we'll use round brackets since we're talking about a plane, that is the one one bar zero plane. So in any, any of the planes in the one one O family are the most densely packed planes for BCC. Um, so that's just something I knew ahead of time. I wouldn't expect you to know that ahead of time. I would, I would ask you explicitly to solve for it probably. Okay. Game starting. Is Utah going to win this year? If none of our players get COVID again. Yeah. Are, do we have players benched because they have COVID? Mm, wasn't that the reason that the game with Arizona got canceled like a week or two ago? Yeah, I'm yeah. curious. If that, is that the case this week? And are they our starters? Are they good players? I heard they were like seniors, so they didn't want to play without them. Oh, gotcha. Well, other questions? I'm happy to answer. You got a free engineering consultant for another 30 minutes. By the way, when this class is over, please, please, please reach out to me. Like, material science is tough stuff, so if you are real engineers and you're out working on a job somewhere and you run into a materials problem, just shoot me an email. I'm, I'm happy to. I love keeping in touch with uh, previous students, and if I'm able to help out, I'm happy to do it. Actually... I just got a research contract with the uh, South Davis Wastewater Treatment Facility. We're making a material that's preventing uh, this mineral from clogging their pipes. And we went out there to meet with them on site because we had prepared the material and now we were ready to meet with the folks where we we're going to implement it. And we meet with them and we're chit-chatting with the guy. And we're like, okay, so anything else we need to do before we kick this project off? And the guy's like, well, you could have given me a better grade in 2010 or 2160. And I'm like, say what? And he was a former student, which was so great. He was just joking, but it was pretty fantastic. So I am happy to help you guys out in the future if you run into materials problems. As a tangent, anybody else have questions on the exam? I think we can focus on that. I think we've covered everything. We haven't covered toughness. Any questions on toughness? Just like a definition, or is there an equation that we should put with it? Well, uh, let me ask you. So let's go back to mechanical properties where we introduced it. It was earlier here. So we said that toughness is defined as the area under the curve, right? Because it's the energy that gets absorbed during deformation. So you should be able to take an integral like this and tell me what a toughness is by taking the area under the curve. And then if I asked for resilience, the difference is that resilience is the same idea, except it stops when you leave elastic deformation. When you transition from elastic to plastic, you're now no longer talking about resilience. You're talking about toughness, right? If you include elastic, this sort of pink region here, and plastic, this purple region, that's toughness. If you're only looking at the region 
under elastic deformation, that's resilience. But in either case, you have to take the integral of that sort of line. Is there a homework problem that we could look at that would help us practice this or? Uh, no, but you're certainly welcome to look like, you know, study yourselves. It, you learned how to do integrals in calculus. So I didn't, I didn't really teach you how to do that. Um, I'd say the key thing to remember is to get the units to work out to energy, right? This is energy under the curve. We talked about it in class that a Pascal is equal to a joule per meter cubed. So if you have some volume of material, like this is like literally some volume of material that's getting deformed throughout the entire volume, that's where your meter cubed comes from. And so when you deform this thing up into a fracture, the, it's, it is one energy, but it's for some volume of material. I, I don't think I need to say more than that for you guys to do okay on the exam. Other questions about this? This is totally off topic, but um, when we're submitting screenshots for the exam, do you want them to be like right after the work we did for it, or do you want them at like the end of the problem or the end of the like PDF? Oh, that's a really good nice question to ask. It's a lot easier if it's right next to it, but we will find it if they're all at the end. But don't do like a mixture. Don't do it like after the problem for some of them, but then randomly put one at the way end because if we start seeing them after the problem, we're going to assume that it's there. So either put them after the problem, all of them, or put them all at the end. But it is a lot easier when it's right next to the problem. We don't have to scroll through your PDFs as much. And make sure that you have this sorted out. Uh, on the last exams, I've gotten so many emails of students saying, hey, I can't get a, a tool to make this merge together. It won't work. Or it's like 80 megabytes big and it won't upload. So like, Go to Adobe Scan. Like you can get this for free. It's an app. Adobe Scan is very, very easy to use. It's a mobile app on, I think, you know, Apple and Google Play. Yeah, you can get it on both. It's great. Has a gazillion upvotes. Just use it. It's the easiest tool to to use. Unless you got something else that you know how to use and love, I would suggest Adobe Scan. Okay. We have something kind of cool that happened. We got, um, it's called 1U for U funding. Um, we got funding to look at pathogens that grow in climbing gyms. So this is pretty cool, I think. Uh, the, the idea is that if you've ever been to a climbing gym, uh, these gals that I work with, one is a pathologist up in the medical school and the other one is actually a librarian. Both of these gals are amazing climbers. So we have been climbers together and they at the gym notice that when they take their shoes off, the mat is pretty gross. And one of them actually thinks that she got like some gnarly warts from other people also having their shoes off. And so we've been generally kind of grossed out at the fact that there's these community mats that are just kind of gross and pathogens might be on them. So we actually got funding from the university to go out and test some mats at the University of Utah. At first we were just gonna do it at the university gym, which is not a great climbing gym, but it's still full of people. And then we actually were thrilled. We got um, momentum and the front and the quarry all to agree to get us to let us go and test their facilities. So we're going to be testing for COVID, among other things, uh, any pathogen. So MRSA, strep, all these different things. We're going to test for them on the mats, on the climbing holds, on the ropes, on the hardware, on the vents, and on the uh, the doors to the bathroom as well as the drinking fountain. And we will see what's where. Now we have to double blind it. So I can't then tell you, oh, don't go to such and such a gym because that's the only reason they let us participate in the studies if we double blinded it. But I think it's going to be really interesting to find it out. So as soon as this uh, review session is over, I'm driving to Lehigh in Provo to go swab for bugs at the climbing gym. It should be very interesting. Wait, so do they not like clean the community mats at all? Uh, so they do, but they do like... They don't, they typically clean them and it depends on the gym. And so we're collecting that information from all these gyms, but even the ambitious gyms only clean them once, maybe twice a day. They might clean it in the morning and once in the middle of the day, but it's much more common that they only spray it 
once at the end of the day after they clean it. And sometimes they don't even spray it, they just vacuum it. Uh, the mats, for example, they usually just vacuum it. So what we're going to find out is whether that's an efficient cleaning regimen. And then we will do some controls where we will take mat material, uh, put some uh, pathogens on it, do a bunch of different cleaning regimens and test it before and after. And then why I'm on this is there's a bunch of materials out there that are pathogen resistant and we're actually going to propose new materials for these things to prevent them from getting uh, pathogens growing on them as regularly. So there's sort of bacteria resistant mat material that they could be using. I think this is so cool. I am pumped about it. I don't want to drive the Lehigh very bad during the game, but I think it's going to be fun. Wait, my question is, how come I feel like regular shoes would be even more dirty than bare feet? Because regular shoes, you walk over everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like what? You know what I mean? I, I see what you're saying. The challenge is when you go to a gym, most uh, the better a climber you get, the more this crazy mentality exists that to, to be a good climber, you have to have shoes that like cripple your feet like Chinese feet binding. And so they buy these shoes that are so uncomfortable that most climbers, as soon as they finish the route, they'll take them off or they'll at least pull their heel out. And now you've got your sweaty foot on the mat and they don't, they like never wear socks. And so you've got your sweaty feet all over a mat. And then multiply that by all the people that are standing in the same spot, sitting in the same spot. Anyway, that's that's the idea is that you've got sweaty, nasty feet. And you could do this at any gym, not just climbing gyms, right? If you've ever gone to any workout gym and people don't wipe down the machine, it's pretty cringy because who knows what's on their body. And now it's on the machine and it's going to be on your back or whatever. I guess this is a comparison. Dead skin cells way worse than anything you would step in outside, I assume. Yeah, yeah and who knows? Maybe it's not. But they did just do a study, not relating to climbing, but in people that have COVID, they're finding the COVID virus in the heating vents, in the air vents to the rooms. It's actually living for longer than they expected in the vents to the rooms, which is problematic if vents are connected to different rooms. And so we were wondering if we would find the same thing. So I don't know. I'm just pumped about this. I'm. It's rarely that I get to work on microbiology or pathogen research. So I think it's just a, a fun field trip for a material scientist to work on a different area for a minute. That's what I was going to say, dude. What don't you do, man? Like, what project can you not be a part of, bro? <laughs> oh, dude, I, I work on all the things. If you ever uh, want to be surprised, you can just pull up my webpage and then go to news. And you can see, like, over the last seven years that I've been at the U, what sort of things we've done. And it is all over the place. Like, we just got funding from the Kuwait Foundation for the Advancement of Sciences to grow single crystals. Thank you, Kuwait. We just got funding to make high temperature alloys from ARPA E like two days ago that just went through. So yeah, we, we work on all sorts of things. Is your research lab really big? Yeah, we got a bunch of people in my in my group. Um, if you take a look at it, we've got seven or eight PhDs, one, two, three, four, okay. five, six, seven, eight PhDs currently, and five, four, four masters, including Andrew, your beloved TA. And then I've got just a You're bunch a of undergrads. Check this out, this gal. She was a freshman at West High School last year, and she joined my group, and I was really skeptical that she would actually take it seriously. She just got a paper published in a good journal. I think I posted it. Did I, did I forget to? If I go to news. Yeah, she was the first author on this paper that we just got published. Oh, yeah, right here. Uh, a data science approach to battery electrolyte design. I was not doing that when I was in ninth grade. I think that is so impressive. Anyway, pretty cool stuff. Wow, you have a lot of... People in your research lab, dang. Um, you should all, I, I don't want to take away from your time. If you have questions, by all means, stop me. But I was just going to say, if you guys haven't gotten involved in research, you totally should. There are so many great faculty, especially in the College of Engineering. Our expenditures in research have just been blowing up over time. We went from being a not very well-known engineering school to a very good engineering school, and it's just getting better all the time which means there's more research happening, which means we need more students like yourselves to participate in research. So go up and if you know of a teacher in mechanical engineering or civil or wherever you guys are that does something that you think sounds cool, go tell them, hey, I want to work on that. Like, what do I got to do? And if they're not a jerk, then they'll find a way to get you in their lab. And I think you'd be surprised how, how anxious we are to get good students in our labs and get them working. Anyway. Other questions about the exam? I kind of felt like we covered everything, but if you got other questions, I'm, I got another 15 minutes to help you out. How's Utah doing? Did we go over polymer length at all? Uh, we didn't. Let's do that really quick. All 
Okay, polymer length uh, was this idea that we know that polymers have this kinked backbone for the most part, and it depends on the polymer, but most of them have this kinked backbone with a 109.5 degree angle there. The reason we have that is because a carbon wants to have four bonds, and so if you draw these things where this means it's coming out towards you and then the dashed means it's going away from you, so these are, you know, let's just do other carbons for a minute. The a carbon having four bonds wants to spread out these bonds from one another because these represent regions of electron density, right? And electrons don't want to overlap each other. So instead they want to spread out and the most efficient way to spread out four things in a sphere is to have a 109.5 degree angle between all of them. So that's what this angle is that we see on these things, right? That's where it comes from. So if these are carbon-carbon bonds, right? Let's say that these are all carbons for a minute. You could look up the bond length for carbon-carbon. What is it? Is it 1.54? I always forget it. Let's look it up. Carbon-carbon bond length. It is, uh, it depends on what type of bond, single versus double versus triple. Obviously, as you move towards like a triple bond, the bond length gets shorter, they're bonded more tightly. But if we're talking about single bonds like we are, yeah, it's 1.54 angstroms, okay? So 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10. So this distance right here, that distance is 1.54 times 10 to the negative 10 meters, okay? Now we're gonna do a little bit of geometry in these type of questions and I'm gonna ask, okay, how long would this whole chain be right there? Well, to answer that question, you'd have to count these bonds. So you'd have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So there are 11 bonds, but the total length, L, L is not equal to 11 times 1.54 angstroms because they zigzag, right? If you, if you could actually make a straight line out of that, it would be longer, but we can't right? These bonds are not going to straighten. They're going to stay roughly at that bond angle. So we need a way to account for that. So what we do instead is we say that L is equal to, what's our formula? Let's make sure we keep it the same as we taught it in class. It's going to be up here, bond length is N times D times the sine of your angle divided by 2. So it's going to be N is the number of our bonds, D is the length of each bond, sine of the angle there divided by two. So in this case, this would be 11, this would be 1.54 angstroms, and we know the angle is 109.5 divided by two. So that would give you L the length of this thing. So you need to know how to use this. It gets a, it can get trickier. Like for example, what if you have a polymer, which is not just a carbon-carbon backbone? What if it's alternating? What if you have like a carbon-carbon a, um, and then a nitrogen? nitrogen, right? And that's your repeat unit is this thing for whatever reason. Okay. Well, this, this is going to influ influence a few things. For one thing, this bond length that we just drew is not going to be the same as this bond length, right? That's now a carbon nitrogen single bond. And so you would have to look up what that is. A carbon nitrogen bond is going to be different. It's going to be for a, uh, 147.9 looks like. So it's different. It's 1.47 angstroms, right? And then a nitrogen nitrogen is going to be different as well, right? So an, an NN bond will be different. You could look it up. It's going to be, looks like 136. I'm looking, I'm, scan, I'm skimming this pretty quick, right? But you, you'd have to take into account different D values. And because nitrogens form three bonds, right? Nitrogens have a lone pair up here, and then they can form, uh, how do they write this, like that? You can form three bonds. This angle won't necessarily be 109.5, so you would need to know what that angle is. I wouldn't expect you to find that in the test. I would tell you that, um, or you could look it up yourselves, but they have different angles. Like for example, oxygen. Oxygen has two lone pairs, and so it only forms bonds like that. And so you'd need to know that angle. Like, what is the angle of an oxygen bond? I don't know what it is. 134, right? If it was perfect three bonds, like if this was like a perfect, you know, three bonds like that, these would all be 120 degrees. But it's not because these lone pairs push it out a little bit more. And so it ends up being 134 degrees. Oh, so they push it out less. All right, this turns out being 134. The point is I could give you that and you could modify this basic thing that we learned in class to account for these slightly 
you know, non-ideal scenarios where the atoms change or the angle changes. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. I guess the question I have that kind of stems from this is what kind of problem would this be accompanied by? So I know that like that wouldn't be the whole problem. You know what I mean? We would use this to find um, in, in, in solving a bigger problem. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I'll say the ones that the homework and I almost always base my test questions very, very closely on homework ones also related this to molecular weight and degree of polymerization. So if you knew the molecular weight of this entire chain and you knew what the mer was, because I told you what type of polymer it was, you could divide the total molecular weight of the chain by the mer weight. Now you know how many repeat units there are. From that, that's going to go into the value of n, right? That'll tell you how to solve for n if you know how many repeat units there are. So it, it's it's a problem like that. Okay, thank you. I remember we did it earlier today. I was just... Okay. Hey, Utah's up on USC. How about that? Just a field goal, but still. In the um, in the past, you've talked about Python versus MATLAB, and why Python. You've talked about how Python's a lot better than MATLAB. Can you talk more about that? Uh, totally, just because it's free. I took a MATLAB class when I was you guys. Um, it's the only programming class I ever took, and I loved it when I was in it. It's a powerful tool. But the second that I left, I didn't have access to that software anymore. And I know that nowadays you have it while you're a student, but you may not have it. If you start a consulting firm, you're going to be paying for that MATLAB license. And that's crazy. It's crazy because first off, there's like what well, Octave is like a free version of MATLAB for one thing. But Python is now getting so good that it can do basically anything MATLAB can do. And more and more of the big corporations, national labs and all the others are starting to build tools in Python, not in MATLAB, because they want it to be interoperable and freely available for everyone else. So um, I think another big advantage is that Python is just a much more general use language. You, you can use it to process images. You can use it to read and write data files in a way that's much more general use than MATLAB, which is really just for scientific, uh, you know, numerical computing. Uh, Python is just a better language overall. So I wish that somebody would have slapped me and said, stop it, learn Python instead. I guess Python wasn't around yet, but I wish I would have learned something freely available rather than MATLAB. Okay. I was doing, I, that's what I'm I finishing up a MATLAB class right now, so I'm thinking I should kind of start stop with it and start learning Python. Yeah, I'm, I'm, by all means, do well in your classes. If you have to take MATLAB for your degree, do it. But man, I would quickly thereafter... Actually, I, I've been posting my videos, so you're welcome to watch them, unless you're sick of me. You can always go to YouTube. I've started a new playlist, <clears throat> and you can check it out. I'm doing it for Python. I'll have it done probably by the end of the year, so it's uh, finished for next year. But if you go to Intro to Python, I'll, I can post a link to this if you guys want. I'm making it easy, and I'm doing mostly Lord of the Rings and Star Wars examples as I go through this. So I, I think it's not the worst thing on the internet. So for what it's worth, you can take a look at that. Sweet. Do you use it in a notebook when you use Python? I use Spider. Some people really like notebooks, like Jupyter Notebooks. Um, here's why I don't like those. They're, they're nice in some ways because you can like run it top to bottom and you can add code. and it, they, look, they look really nice, but my biggest beef with them is you can't look at your variable values in real time, and that is like criminal. That's really crappy, um, but Spider does let you do that. So... Uh, that's why I like Spider. It, it's another free package, right? You're not paying for this. It's really great, and you can see your variables in real time. Why do you want to do that? Because in programming, you almost always want to see when you're debugging something. If something doesn't work, you have to run it through and figure out why it didn't work. Like when I run this, I can run this is when I make all my... Oh, shoot. This is going to show a plot from the test. I can show that. <laughs> but <laughs> I got to close that just in time. Um, you can't... Why not? Uh, it, it, it allows you to show your variables in real time and you can't do that in notebooks like Python or uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So that's why I use it. Oh, yeah, I was creating... I've downloaded Python onto my laptop, but it was always the setup stuff that takes forever, which is more annoying than learning it. So I actually, in my first video, I go over that. Um, actually, how to download it and use it. So for what it's worth, I 
it's it's getting easier and easier to do. Like nowadays, the Anaconda installer works great for for Apple and PC. It's really simple and straightforward. I don't know. I think it's worth your time. I think it also has a nice GUI that goes with it. I think it's called Tkinter. Which one is this? Sorry. Tkinter Python has a built-in uh, GUI. I don't know what that is. User interface. I I should know what that is. I'm not. I'm totally a self-taught programmer, so I don't know what that is. I know what GUIs are, but I don't know this one. Oh, I thought it was. I googled it because I I was looking for a GUI to do something in Python, and um, I looked it up, and the, everyone was recommending T Kinter, T K I N T E R. Wow, I've never and heard of it. It's pretty cool. Uh, it may well be a something awesome. I just haven't heard of it. I find kind of funny about the Python thing. Even all my all my MATLAB teachers will tell us, like, yeah, you should really be learning this in Python. Yeah. So uh, every year, the University of Utah has Data Science Day. We now have a data science uh, certificate. And now it, I think it's soon going to be a department. And I hope to be an affiliate because a lot of my work is data science. But they had a big panel where they brought in somebody from Google, somebody from Microsoft, somebody from oh, where they had big companies. Uh, somebody from Oracle, I think, was there. And they were asking them, you know, what language should we be teaching our undergrads? And every single one of them said Python, except somebody from, I think it was like L3 said uh, MATLAB, which is just silly. But yeah, it's definitely been a change. If you look at the growth of Python, right? Python like posts on Stack Exchange. Uh, Stack Exchange. Whoa, where is it? Exchange over time. Uh, it's definitely taken over all the other languages. This is taking me forever to get, yeah. Like you can see, it's just blowing up. Like Python is eating everything else up. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon, but maybe I'm wrong. So I would learn it. Whoa. It's way over MATLAB. Where's Pretty Python? big too. MATLAB is, let's see. Um, Python versus MATLAB. Mat MATLAB was on that last chart you said. Oh, was it? Oh, that's matplotlib. That's not MATLAB. Um, anyway, it's way less. It's, I think it's a way Matt Pod, something from Python. Yeah, it is on Python. You have it's like a, a library, I guess. Matplotlib is a library. Okay. It's for plotting. Just NumPy. It also, Which is NumPy. also on that same class. And, uh, these are all uh, posts related to those things. Oh, here we go, MATLAB. So look at this. MATLAB is clear down here. Like, it, there's support for it, but nothing like Python. Python's way more. And this is old data. Five years now, it's 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 just grown. Uh, JavaScript. I remember learning JavaScript. Not that you know, JavaScript and C have big advantages over Python. They're compiled languages, so they run hella fast, mm -hmm. way faster than Python. Python is not fast. It's just flexible. Is next semester the only time you're teaching the Python class, or are you gonna teach that? I plan on uh, teaching it in perpetuity, so I will teach it every spring from here on out. But like I said, you can just follow along with the uh, YouTube if you want. I mean, doesn't matter to me. You can even join the Discord. I'll probably make it an open Discord. Huh. So can I? Uh, actually, never mind. That's it. <laughs> take it next semester, but not really take it, and just have it fully done for actually taking it. But I feel like that's I mean, probably. Um, I will say it's probably going to get better over time because it's my first time teaching it, so it'll probably be a disaster next semester as I sort of sort it out and figure it out. Plus, in the future, since my research is on materials informatics, right, using machine learning towards materials research, we're going to add more and more of that in the future. Um, I didn't have time to get it ready for this coming semester, so we'll just sort of touch on it. But in the future, that'll be a big part of what we teach. Anyway, we're out of time, so I'm going to bail because i got to drive to Lehigh still. Uh, any last burning questions before I play out? Thank you, Dr. Sparks. Thank you. Hey, it was my pleasure, y'all. Um, good luck with the test on. So I am going to open the test up at 6 a.m. on Monday, and I feel cringy even doing that, but I'm going to run it from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So you've got 12 hours, so you can decide if you want to wake up early or skip a class or whatever you got to do. But in return, we will try our best to get it graded that night so you can chill about it and not worry about it over Thanksgiving. Okay? All right. Good luck on your drive. <laughs> Lehigh, it's nine o'clock at night. God dang! I know, we <laughs> had so to do it after far. the gym's peak hours, but knowing gyms, what's their Saturday, peak hours? What six? Yeah, they're still going to be slammed. I think. 